So bismillahirrahmanirrahim Alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin Wassalatu wassalamu ala ashrafil anbiya'i wal mursalin Habibina wa nabiyina Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wa sallam Wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in Wa man ihtada bi ihsanin ila yawmiddid Amma ba'ad Allahumma allimna ma yanfa'una Wanfa'na bima allamtana Wa zidna ilma bi rahmatika ya arhamar rahimin I mean, this is a dua that Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would make whenever knowledge is being dispensed. He asks, O oh Allah, Allahumma alimna ma yanfa'una. O oh Allah, bless us with knowledge that is beneficial to us and cause us to benefit from that which you have taught us and increase us in knowledge. For verily, knowledge is what? Knowledge is light, right? Inshallah. So, um, alhamdulillah, we have with us our brother Irshad here. Um, our Ustad, our Sheikh, and he will be speaking to us about some tips for Ramadan, especially catered for um, our young, our older youths, right? <laughs> our older youths, such as yourselves. And um, the, the reason for this, you know, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, the best of you are those whose lives are long and, are, and filled with good deeds. And Ramadan, you know, Allahumma balighna Ramadan, Amin. I'll be that Ramadan is so close. May Allah bless us all to reach and achieve and benefit from the month of Ramadan, inshallah. I mean, it is an incredible opportunity for us to make the best of it. And that is why, inshallah, we will listen to our brother Rishad. And any questions you will have, please feel free to send it all to him, inshallah. And also the program the, from the presentation of the doctor afterwards, if there are any thing that you might want to question from an Islamic perspective, um, inshallah, our brother will be here as well. So please feel free to ask any questions that you might have pertaining to these topics, inshallah. Jazakumullah khair, our brother Yerusha. Jazakumullah khair. <coughs> Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytani rajim, bismillahi wa rahmani rahim. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah alladhi hadana lihadha. Wa ma kunna linahtadi alawla an hadana Allah. Subhanaka la ilma lana illa ma'allamtana innaka anta sami'ul alim Wa tub alayna innaka anta tawwabur rahim Rabbi shrah li sadri wa yassir li amri Wahlul ugdata mi lisani yafqahu qawli amma ba'd First of all we praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala We praise Allah, we thank Him, we glorify Him, we seek His help and aid And we ask Allah to forgive us We ask Allah to protect us we ask Allah to keep us rightly guided. And may the peace and blessings of Allah be upon the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his household, his companions, and all those who follow him in righteousness until yawm al-qiyamah. May Allah make us from among them. Ameen, Ya Rabbal Alameen. My dear brothers and my dear sisters, Alhamdulillah, Allah has blessed us. We are here for another program whereby we can seek knowledge and whereby we can improve our lives so that we become closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So inshallah, we know that Ramadan is a month of spiritual growth. It's a month of taqwa. It's a month of getting closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So today inshallah, I would like to share with you some of the ways we can maximize our Ramadan. Some of the ways we can maximize the benefits of Ramadan. Meaning, take full, take full value for Ramadan. Capitalize on every moment of Ramadan. Regardless if we are fasting or not. Regardless of our age. Regardless if we have an excuse or not. So... Today's program, inshallah, I would like to highlight some areas that we can benefit. We can still benefit from Ramadan and gain maximum reward, inshallah. But first of all, we would like to, to take a look at the categories of people who are permitted not to fast. The category of people who are allowed not to fast but must pay a fidya. So they are not off the hook, no. They are not off the hook that, oh, I'm old, I'm a senior citizen, I'm not, I'm not allowed to fast, Allah give me a, a, an excuse. You're not off the hook, you still have to do something. 
still have to do something. So today you will know, inshallah, what you have to do. So, first category of people who are allowed not to fast, but they still have to pay a fidya. Fidya means a ransom, meaning something that you have to do because you can't fast. All right? Number one, the elderly person. So when elderly men or women reach an age that weakens them from fasting, they do not have to fast but are required to feed a needy person for every day in Ramadan. For every day, 29 or 30 days, right? For the days that he will miss in Ramadan. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us, أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وعلى الذين يطيقونه فدية تعام مسكين that as for those who cannot fast because of difficulty they have a choice either to fast if they are able to or to feed a person for every day so this is direct command from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now Ibn Abbas radiallahu an recited this verse وَعَلَى الَّذِينَ يُطِيقُونَهُ فِدْيَةٌ تُعَامُ مِسْكِينَ But he said for the old man or woman who is unable to fast he or she refrains from fasting and instead feeds a poor person with a sa' a measure equal to four times the quantity held by the two outstretched hand of wheat it is also said that Anas ibn Malik, radiallahu an, companion of the Prophet, when he became old, he had a long life. And when he became old, he became so weak to fast. So he prepared a large dish of tharid and invited 30 poor people who came and they ate their fill. So he wasn't able to fast, so he, he cooked the meal. And he invited them, and they, they, they ate, and they were happy. So we can understand that the elderly men and women in poor health are permitted not to fast, as well as those with chronic illnesses. And we will look at that category later. So instead of fasting, they are obligated, obligated to feed one poor person every day of fasting that they do not perform. However, when an elderly person, when an elderly person reach the point of absent-mindedness, they can't remember, they don't know, they're talking, they don't know what they're talking, right? So it's like they are not in their right mind. So when they reach that stage of their life, that they, they don't know what they're talking about. There will be no fast for them, nor will they be required to feed the, the needy for the missed days. Why? Because now they're in a different category. They're in the category of their cases like that of the insane. Remember, the Prophet wasallam said in a hadith, that rufi al aqlamu ala thalatha that the pen has been lifted from three people a sabi hatta yablug a child until he becomes mature a naim hatta yastaykid the sleeper until he wakes up and then al majnoon hatta ya'kil that the one who is insane until he becomes sane so a person who is not in their right mind they're mentally ill then they do not have to make up the fast, they do not have to give the fidya. Everybody understand? They do not have to give the fidya, they're in a different category. All right, so that's point number one about the elderly. Physical disability, point number two. When a person is mentally sound, but physically weak, and fasting would further weaken his or her body, he or she does not have to fast, but should feed a needy person for every day that they miss. So this is, so the aim of the religion is to make things easy. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he wants to make things easy for us. 
Many places in Quran Allah told us, Fattakullaha mastata'atum. And other verses. So this verse means, Fattakullaha mastata'atum. Fear Allah to the best of your ability. So in this category, this category, physical disability, that when an old person, mentally stable, perfect, he mentally stable, but physically weak to fast, cannot make it to fast, right? Then that person should feed uh, one person, one poor, needy person every day he misses for Ramadan. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also told us, La yukallifu Allahu nafsan illa wus'aha. That Allah does not burden a person beyond its capacity. So Allah wants to make things easy for you. But we sometimes make it difficult for our own selves. Sometimes we are old and we know that if we fast, we might, we might weaken our, our body, make things difficult for our own selves. But still, we, we say that, you know what, I still feel like I want to fast. I miss it, right? You still feel that, that whatever I do as a substitute, you think like it's not enough. My brothers and sisters, listen to the words of Allah. You read Allah who become al yusra wa la you read who become al usur. That Allah wants ease for you, not difficulty. Allah wants ease for you. So if if you you want to, to go against this concession from Allah, right? It means that you're saying that you know better, <laughs> that you know better. You still feel that you can fast and you want to achieve better. The next category, someone who is sick. If someone cannot fast because he or she is sick, but there is the hope that he or she will recover and become able to fast later on, then they have to make up the fast that they missed other days, right? So they have to make up the fast that they missed other days. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَنْ كَانَ مَرِيدًا أَوْ عَلَى سَفَرٍ فَعِدَّةٌ مِنْ أَيَّامٍ أُخَرٍ That whoever is ill or on a journey, the same number of days which one did not observe the fast must be made up other days. So, if he or she cannot fast and there is no hope that they will be able to do so in the future, for example, chronic illness. Someone has a chronic illness that it is difficult for them to make up the fast other days, then what they do? They have to do the fidya, right? Then they have to give the fidya. Fidya means that they have to feed one poor person every day that they miss. That's it. Chronic illness. For example, cancer, kidney problem, heart problem, that they know that if they fast, their body will deteriorate. They will become, you know, they will become sick. Then Allah doesn't want hardship for you. Allah wants ease for you. So my brothers and sisters, it is said that Abdullah ibn Abbas an, he said that this verse, وَعَلَى الَّذِينَ يُطِيقُونَهُ فِدْيَةٌ تُعَامُ مِسْكِينَ فَمَنْ تَتَوَى خَيْرًا فَهُوَ خَيْرُ اللَّهِ وَأَنْ تَسُومُ خَيْرُ لَكُمْ إِن كُنْتُمْ تَعْلَمُونَ That where Allah says, and as for those who can fast with difficulty, that is an old person, that they have a choice either to fast or to feed a miskin, poor person every day. Abdullah ibn Abbas, he said, this was a concession granted to old men and women who are able to fast, but with difficulty. So they have the option of not fasting and feeding one poor person for each day that they missed. And also, there was a situation where Sheikh bin Baz was asked about an old woman who is unable to fast. What should she do? And he replied, she has to feed one poor person for each day 
giving half a sar of the local staple food, whether it is dates, rice, or something else. Half a sar. So this is equivalent to approximately one and a half kilograms. What it, half a sar equivalent to one and a half kilograms. So this was the fatwa of a number of the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, including Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma. Now, the question you might ask is about the fidya. So compensation for not fasting in Ramadan, that how much, what you have to do, what's the dollar amount, and these things. So there are different ways of fulfilling one's fidya by feeding the poor. We know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has left the commandment to a general rule that as for those who, who can fast with difficulty, they have to feed a poor person. So we know that Allah left this as general rule. So it is better for an individual to fulfill his or her fidya directly to a deserving person. So if you know someone, if you know people that you could feed directly, then that's even better for you. Or by giving it to an organization. For example, give it to the local masjid. The local masjid in your community. Bring it to a masjid as Siddiq. And then you, you feel reassured that they will take care of your fidya. That they will distribute it to proper organization, Muslim brothers and sisters who need it. Sometimes you give it to organizations you do not know if they're reputable, if they're, you know, they're good, they say what they, what they say. So it's, it's better that you, you give it to your local masjid. Bring it to Masjid al-Siddiq and then they will disperse it for you, inshallah. However, if it is difficult for them to find people, like if it's difficult for you to find people to give your, your fidya, to feed every day, as I mentioned, bring it to the masjid. And the fidya price can be calculated based on the local price of half a sar, approximately one and a half kilogram of whole wheat, rice, or whatever the staple food is. We know our, our staple food is rice. Here it's rice, right? And roti, right? So that's the staple food of the, of the person who is giving the fidya. And so now, inshallah, we will look at, I will share with you some of the ways that we can maximize our Ramadan. So what we talk about was the categories of people that have to give out the fidya. Inshallah, we will look at some of the ways that we can maximize our Ramadan and make it an experience whereby we can change our lives for the better. First point, have the right niyyah. Have the right intention. So that anything we do, we must have the right intention. So the first step in maximizing our Ramadan is to have the right intention. That we should remind ourselves that the purpose of fasting is to gain taqwa. What is taqwa? Taqwa is that you're conscious of Allah at all times. That it prevents you from committing sins. That, that is simple. Taqwa. So a taqwa is a shield. It's a barrier that prevents you from shaitan. It prevents you from the hellfire. That's taqwa. So this is what you want to achieve. So when you, you make your intention in the beginning of Ramadan that you want to, as a matter of fact, we should start from this month of Sha'ban because this is the month that we prepare for Ramadan. Whatever you want to achieve in Ramadan, you start from this month, inshallah. Actually, we were supposed to start from Rajab. That's when you sow the seeds. Sha'ban, you water the seed. And Ramadan, you reap the harvest. So... The first thing is our intention. It should be solely for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So anything we do, it should be for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Next, set specific goals. What we mean by that is that 
Start by, by setting specific goals for yourself that you want to achieve in Ramadan. So what do you want to achieve in Ramadan? Maybe give up a bad habit. You spend too much time on social media. Spend too much time on the phone talking and gossiping. Right? So you want to get rid of that bad habit. Spend too much time socializing and wasting time. So you want to get rid of that. You want to spend more time with the book of Allah. You want to spend more time with ibadah. Things that will benefit you in the akhirah. So, if it, so you set your specific goals. What do you want to achieve? Maybe you want to, you want to get rid of a sin that only you and Allah knows about. And you, you, you make this uh, your goal, that this Ramadan, inshallah, I'm going to get rid of that sin. Or maybe your goal is to get rid of bad company, bad influences. You have that specific friend that calls you, always want to talk about somebody. So you want to get rid of that friend for Ramadan. Huh? All right. Next, prioritize your time and plan your daily activities. So, the thing is, not because you're not fasting and Allah bless you that you have an, a genuine excuse, it means that every day is like Eid for you. No. You still have to observe the boundaries of, of fasting. You still have to observe the boundaries. In fasting, you don't lie, you don't backbite, you don't cheat. Same thing, when you're not fasting, you have to observe these rules. You have to observe it, not gossiping, not backbiting, not wasting time, not lying, not slandering, not cursing. So your eyes should be fasting. So your, your tongue should be fasting. Your ears should be fasting. As the person who fasts, so you have to also observe the, boundary, the boundaries set by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then, next point, focus on worship. Focus on ibadah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed us, especially at this age that you're in, that you have a lot of time on your hand. You have a lot of time, so you focus on ibadah. Make a schedule, make a timetable, my Ramadan timetable. Starting from Salat al-Fajr, or even before Salat al-Fajr, before, you, before you, 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 before you come to the masjid for Salat al-Fajr, start from before, that you wake up earlier as if you're fasting, as if you will have to take suhoor, and then you pray Salat al-Tahajjud. You pray Salat al-Tahajjud, kopla raka, before Salat al-Fajr. Then have your schedule after Salat al-Fajr, then... I'm going to recite the Quran, maybe 20 verses, 50 verses, revise whatever you already memorized, so you have a timetable, you have a schedule, a Ramadan schedule, bi'ithnillah. So in this way, it increases you in your memorization of Quran, revising Quran, listening to Quran, reciting Quran. You can recite the entire Quran for the month of Ramadan. Bi'idhnillah. So my dear brothers and sisters, it doesn't mean that we have an excuse for not fasting, that we have, we, 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 that we are off the hook, and we, we can't do the things that will earn us the paradise as well. So we spend our time as if we are fasting, listening to Quran. Listening to lectures, increasing our adhkar, making dua, increasing dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Next point, develop good habits. How we maximize our Ramadan? Develop good habits. So use Ramadan as an opportunity to develop good habits that you can carry forward after Ramadan. So this could include improve your eating diet. Improve your diet, improve your exercise as well. Improving all of these things, your exercise, or making time for muhasaba, self-reflection, right? 
self-reflection, reflect upon your life. Allah has blessed you with a long life. So you do muhasaba also. And then ponder and reflect upon the ayats of Allah. When you have more time, that is when shaitan whispers to you. That is when your defense of shaitan has to be very strong. Because shaitan will want you to use your time to do things that will disobey Allah. So this is, you have to reflect upon the ayats, the signs of Allah. And this will help you to be closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Another point, seek knowledge. Remember, it's never too old to learn. So put it on your schedule that you have to seek knowledge. Ramadan is the time that you improve your knowledge. You have to know about your religion. So you can do this by many ways. Attend lectures at the masjid. Come to the masjid. Every, every day we have lectures, we have, we have talks, we have so many programs. So you, you improve your, your, your learning. Every day you should improve. Remember, a believer, two days are not the same. A believer two days are not the same. You don't repeat. You don't rinse and repeat the same the next day. No. It should be better and better and better until death comes to us. Fattakullaha huh? mastata'atum. Fear Allah to the best of your ability. But then you worship Allah until death comes to you. That is what the believer is all about. Next, so, so this point about seeking knowledge, sometimes we as senior citizens, we say that, you know what, I'm too old to learn. Look at the companions of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. How old was the Prophet when he received revelation? At the age of 40. Abu Bakr Siddiq, radiallahu an, he was just younger, maybe a year or two. So they were, they were in their 40s when... When, when Islam, when, when, when he accepted Islam, and then they build on that. So it's never too old to learn. It's never too old to learn. Next point, build the community and connect with family. Build the community and connect with our families. So Ramadan is a time of unity and brotherhood. Ramadan, everybody look forward to Ramadan, that you mix, you socialize, you come together. It's the time that you build brotherhood and sisterhood. So we utilize it for that. So this is a time that you come out. And we should make an effort to connect with our families as well. And this is the time before Ramadan, we should mend any broken relationship with families. That you enter Ramadan without any severed relationship. So you, you pick up the phone and you call your loved one. Pick up the phone and call your brother or sister that you haven't been speaking to for years. Before Ramadan start, call them. Tell them that, you know what? I forgive you for the sake of Allah. I forgive you for the sake of Allah. And they will forgive you also. But you have to make that step. So before Ramadan starts, we have to do that. We have to enter Ramadan without any enmity, without any hatred, any malice for others. So when you, when you enter Ramadan, you enter that your, your heart is clean, you don't have any envy, any enmity, that you love your brother, you love your sister for the sake of Allah. So... We should utilize Ramadan to build community. Use Ramadan as an opportunity to build stronger ties and stronger relationship with your community, your local masjid. So you come to the masjid, you build this community, you build brotherhood and sisterhood. And this will help us after Ramadan. It will help you because remember, shaitan devours you, shaitan attack you when you're alone. So when you have your Muslim brothers and sisters there for you, whenever you're down, after Ramadan, if you're depressed, then you could reach out to your brother and sister from the community, from the masjid, from your local masjid. And they will reassure you. They will uplift you. 
So this is the time that we use. Ramadan is the time we use for building relationship. Next point. Reflect and evaluate. I also mentioned this before, muhasaba, that take time to reflect on your progress throughout the month. So have, after one week, analyze. Analyze your, your, yourself. Have you done enough? Are you sticking to your, your, your goal that you set out before Ramadan? So you analyze week after week if you have done enough and what needs to be improved on. Next, practice self-control. So one of the main purpose of Ramadan is to practice self-control and develop greater discipline. So when we say self-control, control your eyes, control your tongue, control your ears, all parts of your body, right? Your entire body should be one that worships Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Next point, Increase our recitation of Quran. So you build that relationship with Quran. So how you maximize your Ramadan? So you come out of Ramadan better than how you enter it. Bi'idhnillah. So you become closer to the, to the book of Allah. You become closer to the Quran. Ramadan is the month of Quran. So you recite more. Uh, not only recite, but you read the meaning, know what it means, reflect upon the words, and then... Make it, live it, make it reflect upon your life. So you make changes as you learn. Next, give charity. We know this is very big in Ramadan. Start from now to give charity. Spend for the cause of Allah. So charity is a fundamental part of Islam. And Ramadan is the perfect time to increase in charity. So we should give our zakah. We should give our sadaqah. As I mentioned before, uh, give to the local masjid, but we, we know that our brothers and sisters in Gaza, especially, that they're suffering, brothers and sisters in Sudan, they're suffering, they need our charity. So you spend more, you, you spend, you help them. Next, mind your actions and words. Ramadan is a time for cultivating mindfulness and self-discipline. So practice patience. When you fast, then you practice patience. But if you're not fasting, you still practice patience. Practice patience, kindness, gratitude in your interactions with others and be mindful of your thoughts. Be mindful of your words. Be mindful of your actions. So be mindful of your tongue. As they say, taste your words before you spit it out. Right? Taste it <laughs> before you spit it out. And then finally, sign up to volunteer. You have a lot of time, right? In Ramadan especially, volunteer. Volunteer at your local masjid. Volunteer. One of the best ways to earn good deeds is to volunteer during the blessed month of Ramadan. So devoting your spare time to helping others brings joy to them. And then you're becoming closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, ala birri wa taqwa, wa la ala ithmi wal udwan, That cooperate with one another in goodness and in righteousness and do not cooperate in sin and transgression. So, my brothers and sisters, in conclusion, Ramadan is a blessed month that offers us an opportunity to gain taqwa and to come close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So whatever you want to achieve in Ramadan, start now. So in this way, it will be easy. And when Ramadan comes, you hit the ground running. So this is the month. We have a couple, a couple days more to prepare for the month of Ramadan. Bi'idhnillah. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make it easy for us. We ask Allah to help us so that we can uh, benefit and gain maximum from the month of Ramadan. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us life and iman to witness Ramadan. Allahumma balligna Ramadan. Allahumma balligna Ramadan. Allahumma balligna Ramadan. 
Aku lakukan oleh hada wastagfirullah haliwalakum fastagfiru innahu huwal ghafur rahim jazakumullahu khair Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Right. Okay. So, so what we talked about is the fourth category that you have to pay a fidya. What the brother mentioned about is the other category that you cannot fast, but you're able to make up the fast other days. Right? You, you, let's say you're fasting Ramadan and then suddenly you become sick. You have the flu. You can't fast, huh? Because you have the flu, if you, so in this category, this person will have to make up the fast later, other days, the days that he missed in Ramadan. So there is no fidya. This person doesn't have to give the fidya, doesn't have to, to, to feed someone after the month of Ramadan or during the month of Ramadan. So basically, two categories. One category, they cannot fast and they cannot make up the fast. That, ca that category of people have to pay the fidya. The second category, for some reason they can't fast, but they have the ability to make up the fast other days, they do not have to give the fidya. Our next question the brother mentioned about is that uh, giving the, uh, the fidya all at once. So that's... As we saw the, uh, the, the, the hadith from Anas, Anas ibn Malik that he cooked one part of, of this food and he invited people and they partake. So that's one way we could do that. We could give the money one shot before Ramadan to the masjid, that the masjid will take care of it. We could do that. Or every day you can do that also. So whatever is comfortable for you. And the best way is if you know someone who need it and you give them directly. You take care of them directly. I have a question. Does feeding the poor person, does it have to be a Muslim? So it is recommended course it should be a Muslim. If you cannot find a Muslim who need it, right, then non-Muslim. But when you give your charity, when you send it, for example, you send it to those affected, uh, like all parts of the globe who are suffering from oppression and hardship. So in this case, it is Muslim and non-Muslim. But in feeding, you know that, you know, in your locality, you look for Muslims for us. If there is none, then you give it to non-Muslims. Wallahu alam. So as I mentioned, it's half a sar. Half a sar, it's uh, one and a half kilogram of rice. How much is one and a half kilogram of rice? It's uh, two, three pounds, or five pounds of rice. So, yeah, ten, like, say, yeah, six, six, six dollars to ten dollars, yeah, per day. So you don't have to give it Guyana money. Some people they want to cheat. Some people want to cheat the system. They want to send it because you know they get more more for the exchange. You have to pay it where you live. That this is the value of the money, ten dollars U.S. every day. Bismillah. Right, very good. So that's very good. So then you could Right. And also you could give you could Oh. 
So the sister asked if she could send the money to Guyana to take care of, of someone that she knows that is in need. And how much? Yes, you can. If you know that there is someone in need in Guyana, you can. You send it to them. How much? Six to ten dollars per day. And this year it's six dollars per year per day for the fidya, but you send it US dollar. Then they change it, they get the equivalent, inshallah. Jazakallah khair. Any other questions? So think of your questions later. You could always write it down. We can answer it after, inshallah. All right? Jazakum Allah khair.